All right, welcome back. Um, we're continuing this same slide here. We just covered some of the changes in the purchase agreement for uh, and some of the other agreements that the IAR has affected over uh, this year. And you can probably expect next year they're going to be doing the same thing. So when dealing with the purchase agreement, remember we are dealing with these two people where we have this person called the offeree who is better known as the buyer. Actually, we'll make this offer. <laughs> I did this last time and I think I made a mistake. Let's start all over here. If that really confused you, if you didn't catch that mistake, you probably weren't paying attention. If you did catch that mistake, I apologize because the buyer would be the offeror. The offeree would be the seller. All right. And he is going to make this offer, which is his offer to transact some activity in exchange for something he's going to give a value. So he's going to offer money and what he is seeking is the transfer of title, more likely clear title, back to him. The set of conditions in which he is willing for that to happen is called the offer. All right. That offer hopefully gets accepted. And when that contract gets formed, then we start moving towards the closing and all of the things that have to happen in that. All right. So every party has their obligations that they must seek out and perform. The seller's obligation is to make sure that he is eligible to clear the liens. So he's got to be able to bring enough money to the closing table to pay for his outstanding balance on his mortgage, bring the taxes current, and any other liens that he may have occurred from any other place. If there's an HOA or a health and hospital or a judgment, hopefully all of that money would be coming in the form of the sales price. Now, there is a situation sometimes where the seller could sell his property for less than he owes and he literally would bring the difference to the closing table. And I have seen many times where sellers actually have had to pay or bring money. Now, it's not current in the last three or four years have we seen this, but I have seen it over the course of 20 years in many cases where the seller has had to bring 1500 900 to the table to actually do it, all of those obligations that he was asked to do and he agreed to do. The buyer's obligations obviously is to provide money or something of value, which is money for us in the real estate because we're doing this whole arm's length transaction. There are some other obligations that the buyer has to do, and that probably more or less pertain to the financing, like the appraisal, that's going to have to be done. Now, that is paid for by the buyer, but it's really done on behalf of the bank to make sure that it shows up and that they are actually buying the piece of property that they want. Now, the obligations, and maybe that's kind of a strong word, for an agent because I think that obligations may fall in the form of things that we should maybe do. I don't know if we're obliged to do them um, and we can play the semantics game on that all the other time, but things like helping your client order the title work. Um, if you're on the selling side, you might help your client find a home inspector. So those are things that we do out of our customer service relation. I don't honestly believe that we are obligated uh, in the form of absolute deal will collapse if we don't do it. Unlike the other two, if the buyer doesn't bring the money, his deal's gonna collapse. If the seller can't provide clear title, the deal's gonna collapse. Our obligations aren't necessarily as strong and maybe that's a bad word we should be using there. There are other people that may have obligations if they get engaged in this deal, like the title company has to actually do the search to prove that there are no liens or to find the liens that are out there. 
the lender may have obligations to provide income as long as the buyer passes all of the requirements that the lender has. There could be a home inspector that gets engaged. He's going to have obligations to his buyer client to make sure that he provides a report that is both factual, honest, and timely. Uh, there could be attorneys that have to do power, power of attorney forms or sign the deed or make sure the deed is correct. So there are all kinds of other parties involved in this that may have obligations. Now, when the contract gets accepted, it is considered form. All right, and in that contract and that offer, there is a new statement now that has a blank and says the earnest money will be delivered within two days. There are many people that think that it does not pend until I receive the earnest money. That is entirely incorrect. That is entirely incorrect. When you accepted the offer, that offer has become pended. One of the conditions is providing the earnest money. If they do not necessarily meet that time frame, that deal is not dead automatically. You have to give them a chance to cure. You better call them and say, hey, it was due yesterday. We're going to put you on notice. You have 24 hours to cure the problem and bring me the earnest money. But it doesn't automatically become dead just like the failure of any of the other time frames wouldn't necessarily, all right? So we see this a lot here where people are erroneously thinking, hey, they haven't delivered the earnest money. It's not pended yet. That has nothing to do with it. The acceptance of the offer is the what's considered the pending, okay? Good. I'm glad we got that. There's been a lot of question. Um, in the purchase agreement, obviously, there's going to have a legal address. The street address is the worst way in the world for us to identify property. However, <laughs> on our purchase agreement, that's what we have is the street address. Typically what happens is hopefully when you've ordered the preliminary title, your title company is going to provide you with a legal address so that when we transfer or convey the real estate, it will convey based on legal title or legal address, all right? And typically you see this a lot that the tax records, at least on the Indianapolis MLS or the BLC uh, that we call it here, is we have some very watered down version of a legal address. A lot of times you might see, you know, We may see something very basic that just says lot seven, section two of Sherman Commons. We don't get into that whole Northwest Quadrant or the Northwest Quadrant, but that will be inside of the deed when the seller signs that deed to convey the property, it will have the full legal description because that is how we convey property between people is through that legal address your title company would be the one that will provide you that full legal address because ironically to me, oh, we don't sell by street address. You call the title company, they first ask you, what's the address? <laughs> and then they pull the title, the legal uh, description. So we end up using the street address anyway. HOA documents, typically this is a seller's obligation to convey to the buyer Here's the homeowners association. Here's the requirements with it. And if you notice that in the purchase agreement, we have a section called, you know, you have so many days to get them the homeowners association. They have so many days to read the homeowners association. And then they have so many days to respond or agree to the homeowners association. Um, I had a deal several years ago where we came across everything that we could get except we could never agree on the homeowner. The homeowners association would not allow any of the homeowners to park a boat over so big for more than I think three nights or two nights and three days. And our uh, potential buyer 
was actually a, a boat enthusiast and didn't have a place to put his boat and the simple fact that he could not use it or store it in his driveway actually killed the deal. So we agreed and to a purchase price, but actually scuttled the deal based on the homeowners association, all right? There's also going to be the seller's disclosure, which we've talked about, and there's also going to be the lead-based paint disclosure if it's required based on the age of the, the property. So those are all also going to be inside of those contracts or that purchase agreement that we need to talk about. Now, there's also personal property issues that we have to deal with, and there are certain definitions of things that go back to, if you remember way back early, we talked about things like the land, you know, and the natural occurring was the definition uh, of land. And then we had the house on it, which was a, all of these improvements, plus the five bundle of rights. This was the true definition of real property. Well, if something's not real, then it becomes personal property. The difference here, real property would go with the sale and go with the seller, where real property would stay and the new buyer would inherit it, all right? Well, unfortunately, there are going to be some cases where potentially there are going to be things that the buyer wants to stay. And one that I like to draw is, you know, the washer and dryer. Well, by definition, this would be personal property that would actually go with the current owner. If we decide as the buyer, we want to add this into our offer, we are then converting personal to real property through this method called annexation. Annexation means to bring in or to join and you've heard of cities trying to annex other cities to bring them in so that they can get their tax base, all right? So we can convert personal property to real property through annexation, much like, you know, sand and gravel and rock uh, is personal property, but you mix it all together with some cement and all of a sudden pour yourself a new driveway, you now have real property. Well, we can go the other way. In some cases, there might be real property that we want to annex. One that I had a situation with was several years ago was a girl that actually had a rose bush. I love these colored pins. Of course, I'm not an artist. Looks like a retarded St. Bernard drawing this. She had a rose bush that she told us that she wanted to go with her. Now, normally rose bushes would fall under the definition of real property because it is a naturally occurring element which would be part of the real property. So we actually had to sever this. So you can go from real back to personal through a process called severance, all right? You can take something that is attached and make it unattached so that it would go. One of another great example would be some nice light fixture that your seller may have or a ceiling fan or something of that nature, you know, where they've got this really cool chandelier that hangs down and they wanna take that with them by definition, it is fixed in such a manner that it is considered a fixture because it's probably bolted in, it's got wires and all of that. Well, the seller says, hey, I really wanna take that chandelier with me. You would have to exclude it in the listing. One of the things I try and tell my agents and I used to tell potential sellers, if that's the case, let's go in and remove that before we start showing and put in some, you know, really generic kind of light piece 
so that when the potential buyers do their walkthrough, this is what they see, not that. Now, in some cases, you can't do that. For example, let's go back to this. You can't take the washer and dryer out while you're trying to sell the property because obviously they're going to want to do their clothes. So that's probably not an idea for that where you would definitely have to exclude this if you wanted to make sure it went with you. All right. So that is the process of severance and annexation that allows you to convert from personal to real and real to personal. All right. So that is uh, a very key element to bringing in that personal property or taking out that real property. Now, the final walkthrough is always a situation that people want to trust everybody and they don't want to spend the time to do it. Everybody sees it as a added pain. But trust me, it is a situation where that um, needs to be done. There have been many cases where I have, you know, done the walkthrough and there's been no problems. There have been cases where I have not done the walkthrough and there's been no problems. There have been cases of doing the walkthrough and there are problems and this is the key issue that we want to try and solve. This one here where we do the problem there we do the walkthrough and there's been a problem. Of course the fourth version is this. We don't do a walkthrough and there is a problem. These are the ones that we want to try and avoid and we do that by doing this thing called a final walkthrough. I typically try and tell my agents to do a walkthrough early in the morning like 9 or 10, 11 o'clock so that if there is one of these situations pop up you have some time frame to close in the afternoon. You know, there's nothing worse than trying to do a walkthrough at nine o'clock and you've got a schedule closing at 10 and you run into this situation. You may not be able to solve the problem depending on the complexity of whatever the problem is. I mean, if it's something where, hey, you didn't take the trash out or you didn't remove the wood. And I use that one because that's the example we had. We had a situation several years ago where the house my buyers were buying, they loved the house, except along the back of the house, there was a rick of wood and this house contained no fireplace. So I literally asked the other agent, hey, what's all the wood for? Well, they're campers and they love to take their own wood with them. And when they go hiking and camping, they can take their own wood. And I'm like, well, that's kind of cool. You know, if you're a camper, Camping is one of those things that has always sound really cool to me, but never really is. My idea of roughing it is where you actually have to walk to the lobby to get your coffee in the morning, okay? That's my idea of roughing it. These people that do all of this. So in our purchase agreement, we specifically stated, and we called that out, that it was to be removed by the seller. Well, obviously they accepted our purchase agreement. We went to closing. We went to the final walkthrough at 9 a.m. And sure enough, guess what was still at the house? So I called the other agent and said, hey, look, we've got a closing today at 3 o'clock. We need to make sure this wood is gone. And of course, the other agent said to me, would your clients not really close? And this is that fun game of chicken that you get to play. Because I literally told him, I'm like, you know, I don't know. But would your guys be willing to risk that? Because guess what your sellers have already done? Yeah, that's right, moved out. If my guys don't close, guess what your people are going to have to do? Move back in, all right? So we, we, he's like, okay, well, give me some minute here. Let me call somebody. Sure enough, in about 20 minutes, here comes a pickup truck with dad and junior who throw all the wood in the back of the pickup truck as we stand in the house and watch them do that. 
And of course they were mad and they argued. And you know, I told the other agent, dude, this isn't something that we sprung on you. It's not something that we said, oh, and by the way, can you come and get this? This is something that you agreed to do and failed to do it. Now, would my buyers have not closed? Most definitely they would not have not closed. They already told us that. But I literally called the other agent and said, hey, just abide by the contract and everybody's good. Well, when we went to closing, everybody turned out to be friends and everything was good and the closing went smooth and everything happened. So that's a situation of where you have to make sure in that final walkthrough and that you need to go to it. Now I can tell you also horrible stories about deals that we didn't go to the walkthrough and we had huge problems. One of them, guy couldn't make the walkthrough and he said, look, I can't do the walkthrough. I can't get away from work. These people seem nice. We'll just, I'll see you at closing. So we closed about 3.30, got down about 4.30. He called me about 6.30 and he said, hey Raymond, he said, these sellers have taken every light bulb from the house. What can I do? And of course, you know me being the loving, kind, gentle person that I am, simply said, go buy light bulbs. And he's like, can I sue them? And that actually, while it seems funny, actually is the truth. Because once your client accepts the property at closing, it is now his. If there was an issue, it needs to be taken care of in this time frame between the final walkthrough and the closing. If he accepts the property at closing, it is now his issue. He literally did go and file a small claim suit and I have no idea what the ever the outcome was on that. Um, but I'm sure that he still had to go buy light bulbs that night. So you might want to try and do that. Landlord tenant issues, if you're getting into property management, you're going to have that issue as well when tenants move out with personal property. And there's all this other situation, especially if they get evicted or they do a midnight move because the landlord's always questioning, are they moved out or have they not moved out? Are they on vacation? Have they beat me and tried to stiff me for the rent? One small claims judge I had in Lawrence Township told me one day, if their bedding was gone and their toothbrush, those were the things that he kind of looked for to believe that the buyer had actually, or the tenant had actually left. All right. So if a landlord and that you evict or they pull a midnight move and they still have personal property in there, you are supposed to take that out and store it in case that tenant comes back to you and says, hey, where's my stuff? I was on extended vacation for two weeks. I come back. You thought I left. You threw all my stuff out. So in that whole landlord tenant rules, I would make sure that you check your tenant laws in the state you're in or the county to make sure that you can't just throw out a tenant's personal property. You cannot just set it on the curb and let people pick through it, all right? If you're going to incorporate some of this personal property into your purchase agreement, I would suggest that you use an addendum and add those verbiage into the purchase agreement so that you could say, hey, personal property, see addendum. We actually have a personal property addendum sheet that we looked at a minute ago in the IAR forms. So there is a form specifically geared towards the transfer of personal property during the sale or the conveyance of real estate, okay? We are still continuing on with this listing and purchasing, purchase agreement concept. And I encourage you to hang out. We're still having fun here. We're in the fourth lesson of the 30 hour post licensing course. So let's take a break, go up, get a cup of coffee, and we'll see you in just a few minutes.